of UNCLOS that are supportive all the time. The new faces we are seeing today, which is really, really nice, especially given the topic and the challenge of presenting something that many people said, what is actually this about? Uh, so I really thank you your presence. My name is Zuley Karashiro and I'm a lecturer with UNCLOS. And first, on behalf of UNCLOS, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the Nunawa people, the traditional owners of the land on which we now meet, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. We'd also like to thank the Embassy of Argentina for the support with the reception, so you have a good chance to chat and you know, sort of your doubts about the concepts with them during the reception. And on that note, I'd like to invite Ambassador Pedro Villagra Delgado to share a couple of words. Thank you, Suleika. Yeah, I'm going to be very brief. I'm, I'm not surprised with the turnout because of the two eminent Argentines experts in literature that we have today. Guillermo Nad, a very good friend, uh, who has talked also here in the ANU at one point, and uh, he is uh, uh, an expert in literature and in music. A musician, in fact, a composer as well. Unfortunately, today we're not going to listen to him and Faye playing, but I hope the next time we will be able to, to do that. Uh, they have managed to put even Borges to music of tango, so it's a fantastic thing that we will have. We, we had it like last year, I think, or the previous one. Uh, I'm delighted to have you from Melbourne, Guillermo, here, and uh, the, the subject also is a very intriguing one. And, but having Borges and Arguedas in the list that you can already see the, where they're coming from, probably. Obviously, they couldn't be more different, both, in, both writers. And, uh, and uh, also, Eugenia de Muro, who has been a, a good, good addition to, to UNCLAS, and we hope that uh, when, the, when John resumes, and we, uh, we miss you, but uh, I would have wished if you could have stayed the whole time in Argentina. <laughs> but uh, when, when you resume your position, I hope that we can uh, keep uh, Eugenia as well. She's also a PhD in literature, so we, we, we are up for a treat. So, and uh, at the end, uh, the well reception is a bit, really grand name. That was very generous of you, Suleika. The the only thing that I would recommend that you try to the thing that you should try to discover is what is your your levels of alcohol when you leave the place to avoid any fines that will just boost the the revenue of the ACT government. Okay, enjoy. <laughs> I'll just use like three minutes to uh, thank you, Ambassador, to just finish and introduce the speakers. Um, I think doing the welcome to country today has been particularly meaningful, given the message that lies beneath both talks. And I come from political science, so encountering both of them has been a bright moment in my life in two occasions. Eugenia, as you know, is the acting director of UNCLAS, but it's also a visiting fellow with the Spanish School of Language Studies. And Eugenia has offered me the second opportunity to critically engage with this flourishing area among Latin American scholars, which is the Modernity, the Coloniality, Critique, and Project. The article that she will present has just been published, coming fresh in the journal Contra Corriente, so you can access that online and read in details what she's presenting. Guillermo, on the other hand, we met as PhD students in our suffering to adjust to a new land, in our anxiety about being able to speak our minds, and uh, Guillermo is now a lecturer at the University of Melbourne, but Guillermo is actually the first to introduce me to the work of Walter Mignolo and also to these discussions. So I think even though I'm very ignorant in literature, what I've been learning with both of them is to recover my connections with Latin America. I'm Brazilian, but I've always felt much more Latin American, let's say, whatever this means. But, um, and I'm sure the presentation today, as I emphasize to them, is not only about literature, but it's extremely political, because what they propose is a natural challenge of a lot of the parameters of academia. So finishing on that, you know, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Eugenia de Muro and then Guillermo Nath. Thank you. I'm also surprised to see so many of you here. I really thought we were going to have about four people in the audience. So thank you all for coming and for taking time. 
to listen to both Guillermo and myself. So I will be talking about Alejo Carpentier, and in particular his 1953 novel, Los Pasos Perdidos, The Lost Steps, and the critique to Western modernity that he ensues in that novel. This is the overview of my topic, so I'll give you a little bit of knowledge on Carpentier. I'll discuss briefly Lo Real Maravilloso Americano, The Real Marvelous, which isn't really a topic for this talk, but I wanted, if you didn't know much about Carpentier, that's what he's known for, and that was a huge contribution that he made. Then I will talk about Los Pasos Perdidos, um, the critique to the over here and over there that the novel sets up, and I will focus mostly on the history chronology in the novel, and then finally, my critique of Carpentier's critique. So, the Cuban writer Alejo Carpentier is one of the most important Latin American writers of the 20th century. He wrote extensively about Latin American reality and contributed to literature his theory of Lo Real Maravilloso Americano, The Real Marvelous, presented in the prologue to his 1949 novel, El Reino de Este Mundo, The Kingdom of This World. In that essay, Carpentier writes about the marvelous qualities of Latin American reality, presenting the theory that later formed the basis for magic realism. And as you know, a lot of people know of Latin American literature for that magic realist moment of the 1960s. Carpentier actually comes the generation before that in the 40s, and he actually defines the real marvelous that, that, will, inf that will inform magic realism. Um, Carpentier's work was decisive in the formative period of the Latin American new novel. The process that led to the Latin American boom in the 1960s began in the 1920s and were consolidated by the advances of the new novel in the 1940s. Emil Rodríguez Monegal writes that Carpentier, along with Miguel Ángel Asturias, Jorge Luis Borges, Agustín Llanes, and Leopoldo Marechal, belongs to the group of writers who first ruptured the tradition of the novel of the land and who were the great renovators of the narrative genre of the 20th century. I've given you a couple of details there about Carpentier. As you notice, the first one has a question mark, born in Havana to migrant parents. That's what I had understood, well, for about five years when I had read about Carpentier and his biography, until I was actually in the house of, of the Americas in Cuba that I found a book um, by Cesar Aida, and it actually contested that and said that there's a second narrative that he was actually born in Europe and not in Cuba. And this is really important because his entire work actually talks about defining Latin America and talking about the Caribbean. So something so important as where he was born you know, kind of brings some question marks. Um, he was a prolific writer, a novelist, a journalist, a trained pianist and musicologist. And I don't talk about it in this presentation, but The Lost Steps is about a musicologist. He that goes to retrieve musical instruments in, in the jungle in, in, in Latin America. Um, and so it's in part biographical as well. And also importantly, he was counselor in charge of cultural affairs in Paris for the revolutionary government from 1967 until he died. As a, as a bit of information before that, in, in his youth he was actually jailed for being part of the Grupo Minorista and he exiled to France. And this is really interesting because he left France with Robert Desmond's Desmond's passport, who was there for a conference on journalism. Well, that's the myth, at least, that he actually left using someone else's passport, and you know, none other than Robert Desmond. So when he went to France, he actually was amongst the surrealist group of writers. So he wasn't just influenced by surrealism, he was a part of that movement. And he wrote and worked, well, he met people like Pablo Picasso, Hemingway, Le Chirico, as well as André Breton, Louis Aragon, Tristan Zara, Paul Elwood, and Antonina Toad. And this is really important because his notion of the marvelous real actually comes as a reaction to surrealism. So he critiques surrealism for fabricating the marvelous in an artificial way. And his argument is that in Latin America, you find that um, intrinsically, that it's a part of the history and the land of Latin America. Um, and then finally, as I said, Monegal says he's um, part of that generation that renovated the genre. So throughout his literary works, Carpentier enacted the search for an authentic Latin American sensibility entrenched in the history of the continent. Carpentier's work was concerned from the outset with defining and naming Latin American reality, and in particular, the Caribbean. He declares as much himself when in discussing his practice, he states, in general, if we group together what I have written, what I have done, you will see that the obsession with the Caribbean is a constant in me. So it is fitting to consider Carpentier's work 
as a response not so much of specific political projects or, for example, later in his life with the Cuban Revolution as a defense of the Cuban Revolution in particular, but on a much broader scale of the continental thrust of writers who were, in the mid-20th century, innovating Latin, Latin American narrative fiction and reinvigorating the Latin Americanist discourse. That is, reflecting through literature what is Latin America. And there's a huge literary tradition, both in the essays practice and in 20th century narrative, about you know, writers essentially responding to that question and trying to define Latin America, I, I guess, to various degrees of success. Of this process, Carpentier states, quote, I always thought that the Latin American writer, without ceasing to be universal, should attempt to express his world, a world that was all the more interesting for being new, filled with surprises, offering elements that were challenging because they had yet to be exploited by literature. I thought, since I began to be aware of what I wanted to do, that the Latin American writer had a duty to unveil realities hitherto unknown, and above all, to step outside of the nativism, of the typicalism, of the picturesque stamp, in order to deprovincialize our literature and thus elevate it to the category of universal values. It is this conviction that informs the lost steps. In this novel published in 1953, Carp Carpentier mans a critique of Western modernity and capitalism, quite intentionally, and juxtaposes this to an originary and revitalizing Latin American landscape. So there is this very clear dichotomy throughout the entire novel, and that's basically what my talk today is about. The Lost Steps is generally read by critics from this perspective, for being a novel that is critical of mid-20th century Western civilization. And here, obviously, I'm referring to in the Europe and the US, and this is Europe after the Second World War, so at a point of extreme crisis, the crisis of modernity. And that, so in the novel, he critiques that and simultaneously attempts to present Latin America as a solution, as something authentic, virginal, as a new horizon, a way that somewhere where you can begin anew. However, while The Lost Steps is critical of the West, and in certain aspects from a very clear leftist political perspective, it is still, in my, my contention is that it is still a critique of the West from within the West. So Carpentier operates within a Eurocentric framework. I will address this in a moment, but before I think it's necessary to actually give an account of the real marvelous so you know a bit more about what Carpentier says. Carpentier's conception of the real marvelous goes beyond purely literary or thematic concerns. It is a mode that, explo that explores Latin American identity, history, and reality. So in a sense, it's not about literature. It's about an extra literary reality. His focus is on Latin America's cultural milieu with a commitment to the continent's colonial past and to its manifestation of an, a certain kind of neocolonialism in the mid 20th century. As he states, what is the history of all the Americas but a chronicle of the real marvelous? The real marvelous is hence tied to a particular politicized vision of Latin America to the reality of conquest and colonialism and the oppression that that entails and comes, that comes with that, as well as to mestizaje and hybridity, two elements that characterize Latin America. In The Kingdom of This World, for example, a novella whose primary concern is the first slave revolution, that of Haiti in the 18th century, um, the novel provides a poignant critique of the colonial relations of Haiti and the marvelous is conjured up by contrasting precisely the colonizer's culture with that of the colonized and the slaves. And that novel is important precisely because in that prologue is where he talks about the real marvelous, or where he makes public um, his discussions of the real marvelous. So I just want to make a, a quick note that I think this is what differentiates a concept like magic realism, which has become um, a kind of trendy concept to talk about Latin American literature and something like The Real Marvelous, because The Real Marvelous is not just an aesthetic. It's not just put, mixing reality and the fantastic. It actually is based on a belief of, you know, not, not on a belief, on a discussion of the colonial reality of Latin America. And that, that's how it emerges. And in fact, in the prologue of The Kingdom to This World, Carpentier writes against codified fabrications of the marvelous or the fantastic. Um, and this suffices to differentiate the real marvelous from any kind of haphazard definition of magic realism. 
Carpentier argues that the marvelous is organic and constitutive of Latin American reality and history and not something that is invented. And in the prologue, he, he writes, actually not in the prologue, in, in another piece of writing, he writes, I saw that in any city of Latin America, in Rio de Janeiro, in Mexico, in Havana, one finds that the unusual is born spontaneously because one finds things and one doesn't know how they got there. In the cities of Latin America, there are entire streets which are surrealist streets through a type of magic because they're filled with unexpected objects and one finds peculiar things in them. So again, his critique is that the surrealists uh, had to labor at coming up with something um, fantastic or other, whether it's the marvelous is something that is intrinsic and organic in Latin America. So Carpentier ties the idea of the marvelous to a material reality. Critics such as Gonzalez Echeverria, Richardson, Martin, and Ciampi have observed Carpentier's real marvelous, the Carpentier of real, real marvelous subscribes to a European perspective of irreality by which early Europeans and colonizers had defined the American soil. So basically, they accuse Carpentier of being Eurocentric in his definition of the real marvelous. While asserting Latin America's uniqueness, the theory of the real marvelous still endorses a Eurocentric conception of Latin America as an exotic other. As Gonzalez Echeverria explains, to assume that the marvelous exists only in America is to adopt a spurious European perspective, since it is only from the other side that alterity and difference may be discovered. The same thing from within is homogeneous, smooth, without edges. So it's only from the perspective of someone thinking through Europe that you can look at Latin America and say that's marvelous. If that's the reality that you live and that's the only thing you know, it's not marvelous, it's actually just reality. Or just straightforward. Richardson has similarly pointed out that Carpentier's real marvelous failed to change the colonial conditions that define the relationship between Europe and Latin America and the Caribbean, arguing that, quote, the problem with Carpentier's conception of an independent American sensibility is that it leaves intact the power relations actually in force in the world. There is contained within it a refusal to engage with the dynamic essential to the way in which cultures interact. I would like to extend a critique along these lines to the representation of Latin America in the lost steps. Through a reflexive protagonist, the novel draws a comparison between the degraded and corrupted culture of the West post-World War II, as I've already said, and the natural and primitive world of Latin America. And just the, even the terms, you know, we're talking about civilization and a primitive world on the other side. At first glance, it would seem that Latin America is a viable alternative from which to correct the errors of history. And in this, there is a clear intention to elevate Latin American culture to a level of universality and to ultimately challenge its position on the periphery of the West. So I think that Carpentier, in mounting his critique, I think he has all the best intentions in actually elevating Latin America. Um, but again, my argument is that he still does that from within a Eurocentric perspective. So the novel <coughs> fails in this because Carpentier is unable to extricate it from a Western-centric account of modernity. While the main literary tropes of the novel um, all elevate the authentic world of Latin America over the West, Carpentier's gesture still remains superficial and is deeply embedded in Western discourse. Despite the intention to challenge Latin America's peripheral position, this has been done within a Eurocentric framework. Carpentier, essentially he changes the content but leaves intact the overall structure that defines that relationship between Latin America and the West. So that's the broad critique. Moving beyond this, the Lost Steps reifies what the Peruvian sociolo sociologist Aníbal Quijano has defined as the myth of modernity and also adheres to what the Mexican-Argentinian philosopher discusses as the fallacy of developmentalism. And I will get to this towards the end of the paper. Carpentier's construction of the Latin America West dichotomy relies on an uncritical assimilation of loaded paradigms, such as one directional history, linear chronology, and the very idea of development. So that his critique is still contained. I mean, he's basically taken concepts that are ideological and they've become completely naturalized. And he's enacted the critique from that perspective. Um, and throughout, this no throughout the novel, these tropes or these, the, 
the themes that he discusses are framed within his own kind of classical Marxist humanist reading of alienation. So hopefully now we get to the argument um, and all of this will become more clear. So just to give you a kind of overview of what The Lost Steps is about, the basic narrative of The Lost Steps follows a composer and musicologist who accepts an assignment to travel to the jungle in search of primitive, primitive musical instruments. The protagonist narrator undertakes a journey from the modern city to an unnamed country of Latin, in Latin America. Once there, they travel from the capital city to the provincial towns and eventually leave civilization and enter the jungle. Amidst the natural landscape, the protagonist encounters indigenous communities, retrieves the musical instruments that were the reason for the trip and so fulfills his obligations or the reason why he traveled there. In the process, however, a radical transformation takes place and rather than return to, civil to the civilization of the Western style city, the protagonist chooses to stay in the jungle to begin a new life. This ultimately proves impossible, so he leaves the settlement in the jungle, hoping to return, but then he can never return. So basically it goes from a modern city to a Latin American capital, to a provincial town, to the middle of the jungle, where he wants to stay because he feels that he has finally overcome the alienation of the modern city, but then he leaves and he can never return. Through this physical journey, the novel traces the protagonist's acquisition of a new consciousness, and this transformation forms the basis for the novel's critique of modernity. Through his experiences and reflection, the protagonist posits a corrupted waste West against an authentic Latin America. So there's this really strong reflexive narrator protagonist who, as he travels through the different spaces, actually constructs a narrative, um, talking about the West is over there and then Latin America is over here. What becomes evident is that The Lost Steps has a dual intention, to carry out a Marxist critique of alienation and intellectualism as a lived experience of the Western metropolis, and this has been documented by critics such as Sulma Palermo, and to raise Latin America to a central and universal position by showing how in being a black canvas, Latin America can have a restorative effect. And this has been, again, um, this is the assertion of critics such as Sousa, Suberskasio, and Gonzalez Echeverria. What's interesting is that throughout, throughout the settings of the novel, none of them, so all of them remain unspecified. And in the same way, the protagonist is never named, so it's always ever referred as the protagonist narrator. And this kind of ambiguity functions to give a sense of universality to the events narrated. And if you think back to the quote that Carpentier said of elevating Latin American literature to a level of universality, that goes kind of some way into it, because it's actually all of the places are emblematic. You know, they could be, so the modern city, for example, could be any modern city. The capital, the Latin American country could be any of the countries in Latin America, same thing with the capital and so on. In some of his writings, however, and in, in a postscript note that comes adjacent to, uh, with the book, um, he does provide the locations that these places are based upon. And the modern city is actually based on New York. The Latin American country is Venezuela, um, the capital Caracas, of course. But again, in the novel, each place is emblematic. Uh, and the same thing happens in the description of the protagonist, so that the problems that he faces are not the result of his own idiosyncrasies or of his personality, but are actually his kind of represented, representative of modern man, uh, of an everyman. And as Gonzalez Echeverria has said, he's modern man in the sense of man after the fall. So Carpentier's critique of Western societies is not defined as particular to Latin America, but as a result of the modern experience more generally. And again, I'll, I'll try and discuss that um, in more detail. So, obviously I'm not going to talk about all of these things because we would be here six hours and you would probably all hate me at the end of it. But the entire novel, as I said, it's about a protagonist and he travels through and he sets this dichotomous relationship between Latin America and the West. And that is pretty much evident in the treatment and in the themes throughout the, the entire novel. So there's a process called of character archetyping. Um, again, each of the characters is emblematic. They're, they're not defined in terms of their own idiosyncrasies, but as kind of subjects that we could all recognize. 
there's a, a really poignant critique, Marxist critique of alienation in the modern city, uh, and this is related to the production of art and um, the subject being within commodity production. Um, there's also, even the, the landscape, so the city in the early sections of the novel is this really hostile environment and it's individualistic. Um, and then in the, in the jungle, it's you know, an Eden and a paradise and pristine. And then what I will talk about more today is the history chronology. So basically what the novel shows or what it represents is that the West, which is over there, and that also serves to kind of distance um, the critique to the West, but the West is represented as kind of the historical present and bear, bears the burden of history, whilst Latin America somehow is atemporal and it's this you know, blank canvas where everything can begin anew. So I'm quite happy later when we're out there having a drink to go through any of those things if you want, but again, I'm not going to do it here. So looking more in depth, there's this, the representation of history and linear chronology. Um, history in the Lost Steps has a much more expansive role than simply presenting the history of the conquest or of the colonial experience. The novel represents the history. Um, the novel represents the history of Latin America in relation to the history of civilization, and relies on this as the foundation from which to make the above critical criticisms of the West. So basically, um, as they travel through different geographical places, history is undone until, again, reaching the middle of the jungle. They're basically in the year zero, where history hasn't happened yet. Um, the protagonist recounts traveling through different historical periods until reaching somewhere deep in the jungle the origins of man, stating, we had emerged from the Paleolithic to enter a state that pushed the limits of human life back to the darkest murk of the night of ages. As they travel through the physical landscapes, the protagonist and his party concurrently move through different historical epochs. The historical moments are related to the geographical places that they encounter. This relies explicitly on a development of developmentalist view based on linear chronology that moves crudely from nature to civilization. The contrast between historical times is made by comparing explicitly the historical present of the West and the ahistorical reality of Latin America, and explicitly the Latin American jungle. In her analysis of temporality in the novel, Palermo distinguishes between time in retrocession and time in progression. So again, if we go back to the, the plot and the fact that it is about someone that moves through different geographical places and moves through times, and that happens really slowly throughout the novel, so that's time going in retrogression, but then when he returns to the modern city, he does so by plane, and he does so in, uh, you know, whatever, an hour and a half. And so what, that, what undoes all of history can then be undone as well, and you can suddenly be in in the present again. Um, so both processes of going in time in retrogression and time in progression are achieved by the geographical movements of the protagonist from the city to the jungle and on his return trip from the jungle back to the city. In retrocession, so going backwards, this leads from modernity to origins. The movement begins in the historical present of the mid 20th century and retrogresses through the colonial era, the discovery and conquest of the Americas, the Renaissance, Renaissance and the Middle Ages, until arriving at, well, at the inception of human culture and at what Carpentier calls the world of Genesis. Entering the jungle, the narrator comments, in headlong flight, the years emptied, ran backwards, were erased, restoring calendars, moons, changing centuries numbered in three figures to those of single numbers. The process of retrocession is used to undo major historical events, as the narrator again says, I find this very interesting. The gleam of the grail has disappeared. The nails have fallen from the cross. The many changes have returned to the temple. The star of Bethlehem has faded. And it is the year zero when the angel of the Annunciation returned to heaven. The jungle is thus con constructed against the expansive history of Western civilization. Retrocession only ends with an encounter with the most primal forms of life in a landscape that is remote and original. <laughs> 
Here, before Western civilization and Western history has taken its course, amid what the protagonist calls his human larvae, so they're not, they're not even human, they're larvae, that the protagonist is reluctant to acknowledge as beings, he astonishes at the, at the birth of culture. He says, in the vast jungle, filling with night terrors, there arose a word. This would be presumably the first word. You know, this is the birth of culture. A word that was more than word. This was something far beyond language, and yet still far from song, something that had not yet discovered vocalization. This primordial, prim, primordial experience of man in the deep recesses of the jungle is more marvelous than the entire history of civilization that has been undone by the journey through it. So this moment that this person from mid 20th century can suddenly be beyond the year zero, the beginning of humanity. It is compelling to know that the analysis of history that the novel affects can only be carried out by a man from over there, from the West, entrenched in Western discourse, who possesses knowledge, who possesses a knowledge, a knowledge emanating beyond the confines of the jungle. Through his particular experience of time, what Palermo refers to as the protagonist internal time, history can be erased and man can return to the Paleolithic. And again, this is the narrator who says, now the dates on the other side of the year zero are back, dates of two, three, five figures, until we are at the time when man, weary of wandering about the earth, invented agriculture, when he established the first villages along the rivers and needing greater music passed from the rhythm stick to the drum. We are in the Paleolithic age. So this return constitutes a zero degree from which history and simultaneously the narrative can begin anew. And Gonzalez Echeverria says that Los Pasos Perdidos, or the Lost Steps, brings us back looking for an empty present wherein we can begin again and make a first inscription. So that's for the representation of Latin America. With the West, as I said, in contrast to this, the West is the historical present of mid 20th century. Um, while Latin America is related to the origins of man and culture, the West bears the burden of history. This is a clear schism throughout the narrative. And I think I've chosen the most pertinent quote, which is a quote about the Holocaust and basically the, collapsed, the collapse of Western civilization. So he, he says, what was new and precedented modern was the cavern of horror, the ministry of horror, that preserve of horror whose acquaintance we were to make as we proceeded. The mansion of shudders in which everything bore witness to torture, mass extermination, crematories, all set in walls spattered with blood and ordure, heaps of bones, human dangers shoveled up in corners, not to mention even worse, worse deaths accomplished coldly by rubber, rubber gloved hands in the neat bright aseptic, aseptic whiteness of operating rooms. Two paces away, a sensitive, cultivated people ignoring the smoke pole of certain chimneys from which shortly before prayers howled in Yiddish had risen, went on collecting stamps, studying racial, glor racial glories, playing Mozart. So what he's saying basically is that in the West, like the culmination, culmination of Western civilization is the Holocaust and the fact that you've got these most atrocious crimes of humanity and meanwhile, you've got people collecting stamps. And that's the present. So if we see the Holocaust, the Holocaust is a direct product of the so-called progress of European culture, the culmination of Western civilization in what he terms the most cold-blooded barbarism in history and the total bankruptcy of Western man. And of course, Carpentier is not alone in that critique um, because I think there are a myriad, a myriad of writers and intellectuals who have, you know, Spengler and the decline of the West and um, who have looked at the collapse of the West as, you know, after the First World War and the Second World War. So I know I'm running out of time, but I do want to get to what my critique is. Um, so basically, my critique is that in order for Carpentier to be able to make this critique of the West, he still conceptualizes the West as the present moment. So the capacity of Western modernity to become hegemonic relies on the belief that development departs from a state of nature and primitiveness until reaching, following a European model, its highest point of civilization. The idea of a one-directional linear chronology that structures the movement 
of evolution and development is central to a Eurocentric vision of history. As Quijano explains, the foundational myth of, Eurocentric, of, a, of the Eurocentric version of modernity is the idea of the state of nature as the point of departure for the civilized course of history whose culmination is European or Western civilization. From this myth originated the specifically Eurocentric evolutionist perspective of linear and unidirectional movement and changes in history. Similarly, Enrique Dussel contends that the fallacy of developmentalism consists in thinking that the path of Europe's modern development must be followed unilaterally, unilaterally by every other culture. A principal characteristic characteristic of Eurocentrism is the narration of modernity as a purely European phenomenon whose culmination is European civilization. The myth of modernity is based on the assumption that as Europe came into contact with other inferior cultures and races, the rationality and modernity became, became exclusively European products and experiences. And this resulted in the designation of other cultures as lacking the same capacity for rational thought and being defined as primitives. So again, I want to go back to that idea that Carpentier, when Carpentier describes the indigenous people in the jungle as amid human larvae. And I don't think I need to go further than that. Um, This process was structured through the dual binary logic of dialectic thought, integral to Western epistemology. And I guess essentially that is what my critique of Carpentier's critique of Western society is, is that he leaves intact that binary. So that you still have the primitive and the civilized, the European and the non-European, the magical and mythic and the scientific, the irrational and the rational, the traditional, the modern, and the, the traditional and the modern Europe and not Europe. So, and that that binary is an entire system that reinforces European superiority, um, and it has developed historically by, the, by enacting that binary. So to conclude, um, basically, through the journey, through the geographical journey and the journey through time, Carpentier preserves Latin America as a virginal and primitive land, landscape. He tries to elevate it by saying that it's a paradise or an Eden where history can begin anew. Um, and Latin America is constructed as a space that can bring restoration to the problems of Western, you know, mid 20th century Western societies. And in this kind of superficial reading, you can see a kind of post-colonial critique or, or a Carpentier trying to be critical of the West and trying to elevate Latin America. However, even though his representation aims to positively evaluate Latin America, the narrative relies on the ideological assumption that the West embodies the present and modernity and is the end result of history and progress, and Latin America occupies a pre- or a historical plane. The contrast of the Western metropolis and of the Latin American jungle, the representation of alienation and disalienation, and again, this is something that I chose not to cover here because I well, it's too long. Um, and that journey through the physical landscape, basically all of the devices and tropes of the novel are based on a kind of developmentalist view, that you start from a state of nature and you end up at civilization. And even though he was trying to be critical, that's what he postulated. And if you do want to see the article, you can do that. All right, that's all. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ankla, for inviting me for this seminar. And thank you for, uh, to His Excellency Pedro Villaga Delgado, Ambassador of Argentina, for supporting this event. Today I'm going to talk about uh, Latin American writers Jorge Luis Borges and Jose Maria Arguedas and their literary responses to the need and challenges of cultural decolonization. I am interested in exploring ways of challenging what Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano calls cultural coloniality, that is the colonization of the imagination. Or like French historian of colonial Mexico, Serge Grusinski put it, la colonización del imaginaire, that is ways of seeing, feeling, and understanding reality. <clears throat> 
Coloniality refers to a structure of power that transforms differences into values, naturalizes hierarchies, and justifies domination. In Latin America, the forms and effects of cultural coloniality have been different according to regions, times, and cases, but it has been in place since the conquest and colonization of Mexico and Peru, and has yet to reach its limits. In my current research, I am interested in three interconnected lines of inquiry related, related to one, the legacies of the Spanish Empire, two, the more recent British and US imperial expansion to Latin America, and three, Hispanic migration towards the United States. In this context, I will explore in this paper Jorge Luis Borges and Jose Maria Arguedas decolonizing literary practices how they challenge the cultural hierarchies created by the coloniality of power and assess their legacies. Jorge Luis Borges was born in Buenos Aires in 1899 and he spent a cloistered childhood in Argentina's capital. English was the first language of his father and paternal grandmother and English was the first language he learned to read. At home, Borges said, both English and Spanish were commonly used. And then he added, if I were asked to name the chief event in my life, I should say my father's library, a library of an unlimited amount of English books. In English, he read not only Berkeley, William James, Spencer, the English romantic poets, Edgar Allan Poe, and the Encyclopedia Britannica, but also Don Quixote, when later I read Don Quixote in Spanish, he said, it sounded like a bad translation to me. <laughs> yeah. In 1914, Borges' family moved to Europe, settled in Geneva and later Lugano, where he learned French, Latin, and German. In 1919, the family relocated temporarily in Spain and in 1921 returned to Buenos Aires. For over two decades, Borges was professor of English and American literature at the University of Buenos Aires. By the 1960s and early 70s, Borges reached a peak of popular acclaim both in Argentina and abroad. The collection of his writing that Penguin published in Britain in 1970, Labyrinth, became a cult hit. Borges was to become a sort of uh, literary pop star. In 1970, the film Performance, starring Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, turned Borges into an icon for the cultural vanguard of swinging London. The film paid homage to Borges in several ways. For example, Jagger reads Borges in the bathtub, and at the very end of the film, when he is shot by a gangster, an image of Borges flashes on a screen. Performance owed its plot to some of Borges' most compelling themes, such as the labyrinth, violence, fictionality, and the enigma of personal identity, although strangely transposed to a world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Let me tell you about Borges' first book of short stories, A Universal History of Infamy or Historia Universal de la Infamia. Between 1933 and 1934, Borges worked for the evening newspaper Critica as the co-editor of its Saturday supplement Revista Multicolor de los Sábados, the most famous cultural supplement of Argentine journalism. By the time Borges joined Critica, it had achieved the highest circulation of any Spanish language newspaper. It was in Critica that Borges began publishing a series of short stories portraits of murderers, gangsters, impostors, pirates that were collected as Historia Universal de la Infamia, a book that also includes his first person narrative of a Buenos Aires thug, the famous Hombre de la Esquina Rosada. In this first book of narrative, Borges displays what will became, become his three main literary strategies. Reading, mainly in English, in order to write in Spanish, translation and rewriting. In most of the stories of Historia Universal de la Infamia, Borges chooses 
themes such as European versions of Oriental fictions, lies of North American bondits and gunmets, gunmen, episodes concerning Chinese pirates, false Persian prophets, or Japanese warlords. These stories are all based on English text. Borges' sources include The Gangs of New York, The Saga of Billy the Kid, Tales of Old Japan, and the Encyclopedia Britannica. But in Borges' treatment of these narratives, they undergo a transcultural transformation. Firstly, the stories are written with a strategic use of Buenos Aires' popular speech. And secondly, Borges radically changes the narrator's point of view. Two stories illustrate these transcultural transformations in the place of enunciation. El Proveedor de Inequidades, Mank Ismant, and El Impostor Inverosímil, Tom Castro. These two stories. The first one tells the story of Edward Mank Eastman, a New York City gangster and leader of the Eastman Gang, which became one of the most powerful street gangs in New York City at the turn of the 20th century. But Borges starts his story with a description of a knife fight between two Argentinian thugs. He breaks down the story into eight subheadlines, sub and the first one clearly shows the narrator's place of enunciations. Los de esta América, the, the tough of this side of the Americas. Perfilados bien por un fondo de paredes celestes o de cielo alto, dos compadritos envainados en seria ropa negra bailan sobre zapatos de mujer un baile gravísimo que es el de los cuchillos parejos, hasta que de una oreja salta un clavel porque el cuchillo ha entrado en un hombre, que cierra con su muerte horizontal el baile sin música. Resignado, el otro se acomoda el chambergo y consagra su vejez a la narración de ese duelo tan limpio. Esa es la historia detallada y total de nuestro malevaje. La de los hombres de pelea de Nueva York es más vertiginosa y más torpe. Borges is talking about two guys in Buenos Aires having a knife fight. While the New York fighters are fast, these two have more style. <laughs> Then he proceeds with the New York side of the story with the following subheading, the tough of the other side of the Americas. Now, all these American characters from the underworld of New York are described by Borges as compadritos and malevos, the tough larrikin guys of the slums. The same happens with the well-known American outlaw and gunman Billy the Kid, also characterized by Borges, by Borges as a compadrito. Borges uses a local urban archetype deeply rooted in Argentine cultural imaginary, a compadrito, to describe a character that is central to the American imaginary. This is completely lost in the English version of Borges' book, where Billy the Kid and Mank Eastman Gunn are simply referred to as a New York hoodlum or thugs and ruffians of New York, respectively. So Borges is not just rewriting text written in English, he's also displacing the centrality of English language, giving dominance to local Argentine archetypes and languages. Language. The other story I want to focus is El Impostor Inverosímil Tom Castro. Uh, it is based on the article titled The Tichborne Claimant from the Encyclopedia Britannica. What is the Tichborne Claimant? The Tichborne case centered on the claim by Arthur Orton, the son of an English butcher, to be the heir to an English estate and a noble title. So who is the Tom Castro of the title in Borges' story? The Encyclopedia Britannica tells the story of a certain Arthur Orthon, son of a butcher of Wapping, England, who migrates to Australia. In his way to Australia, Orton stays for a while in Chile, where he's hosted by a family of the name Castro. Once in Australia, Orton changes his name and becomes Tom Castro and opens a butchery, first in Wagga Wagga and then in Sydney. <coughs> Towards 1865, Orton, now Tom Castro, 
reads in the Australian press that a certain lady Tichborn from one of the wealthiest Catholic families in England never believed that her eldest son had died in a shipwreck off the coast of South America in 1854. She clung to the rumor that some survivors had been picked up by a ship on its way to Australia and had advertised in Sydney for any news of her son. In spite of not resembling Tichborn at all, when Orton slash Castro reads his, this news, he decides uh, to pretend he is Lady Tichborn's son. So he travels to England and manages to convince Lady Tichborn that he is her son and becomes the heir to the wealth of the Tichborns. But the family was not convinced, and after Lady Tichborn died, and after a long trial, the jury found that the claimant was an imposter. From 1866 to 1874, this case fired the imagination of most of the population in England and Australia, and the claimant became a notorious celebrity and the subject of songs, plays, and cartoons. This was one of the longest running court cases in British judicial history. This is basically the story in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, based on this simple biographical entry, Borges writes one of his most entertaining and witty stories, Tom Castro, the Implausible Impostor, a short story that encompasses three continents. The Encyclopedia Britannica also mentioned a bogle who had been a slave in Jamaica and later was taken to England in the mid-1820s by Sir Edward Tichborn, who employed him as his valet. In 1853, Sir Edward died, and shortly after, Bogle migrated to Australia, where he met Arthur Orton Tom Castro. In the Britannica, there is no doubt that Orton is the main character in the story. He is the presumed Tichborn of the title, and the imposture is his own invention. But Borges radically altered this. Borges invents a first name for Bogle, Ebenezer, and he becomes the focus of the story. Bogle is the genius who dreams up the impersonation scheme. He pulls the strings, and it is he, the black Jamaican former slave, who Borges rewrites as the mastermind. So what was marginal in the story of the Britannica becomes central in Borges' story. In the first place, we can see the playful undermining of supposedly objective kind of knowledge, such as biography or history, that will characterize postmodernism. But more crucially, we could say that Borges has taken over not only the narrative of the Britannica, but all that other text too. He changed not just the language, but the literary structure and the worldview or place on, of enunciation of the story. The Encyclopedia Britannica presented itself as a survey of universal knowledge. But if universal knowledge or universal history are a knowledge or a history that hide their own geopolitical grounding, then Borges ironically subverts them by openly displaying his own geopolitical place of enunciation. This is the way he starts the story. Ese nombre le doy, Tom Castro, porque bajo ese nombre lo conocieron por las calles y por casas de Talcahuano, de Santiago de Chile y de Valparaíso, hacia 1850. So if the Britannica represents an imperial alliance between language, knowledge, and power, Borges clearly undermines it. To Borges, the 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica were not a survey of universal knowledge, nor the world's mirror, but simply other objects that had been added to the world. Like Borges, the Peruvian writer Jose Maria Arguedas also had a lifetime commitment to, raising mono, to resisting monologic structures of power, language, and knowledge. Argueda's life and interlanguage trajectory is summarized in this narrative about his early experiences. <clears throat> 
My mother died when I was two and a half. My father married the second time, a woman who had three sons and who owned half the town. She had many indigenous servants, as well as the traditional contempt and ignorance of what an indigenous person was. And because she despised and hated me as much as her indigenous servants, she decided that I was to live with them in the kitchen, eat and sleep there. As his friend Emilio was fallen explained, Argueda's destiny was a special one. He happened to suffer in his own flesh from within the basic cultural dichotomy of the country. In, 19, in 1937, while a student at the Universidad de San Marcos in Lima, Arguedas was involved in the dumping in a university fountain of an Italian fascist general, General Camarota, Mussolini's special envoy to Peru. This incident took place during the military rule of General Oscar Raimundo Benavides. Arguedas was arrested and spent 11 months in El Sexto prison. Out of his experience in prison, he wrote the testimonial law novel, El Sexto. Arguedas was most productive from the mid 1950s until his death, death in 1969. In 1963, he earned a doctorate in ethnology from the Universidad de San Marcos in Lima. He also was a leader of National Institute of Museums of Culture, Folklore and History. He played the guitar, sang in Quechua, and published extensively on Andean ethnography, folklore, and musicology. What was the state of the debate when Arguedas started his career? The Peruvian literary field was divided between Hispanistas and Indigenistas. Latin American Hispanismo represented a spirit of reconciliation with Spain that revalued Latin American Spanish heritage. Throughout Latin America, the ideas of the Spanish generation of 1898 played a major role in shaping early 20th century Hispanismo. In Peru, Hispanistas were best represented by José de la Riva Agüero. In his essay called Carácter de la Literatura del Perú Independiente, he says, there is a theory which I find limited and unproductive that literature can be Latin Americanized by going back to before the conquest and bringing to life the Quechua and Inca civilizations with the ideas and feelings of the natives. This is not to Latin Americanize, but to romanticize. Those civilizations and semi-civilizations are dead and extinct. There is no way to revive their tradition because they left no literature for criollos of Spanish blood, they are foreign and strange and nothing links us to them. Opposing this view were the indigenistas. Indigenismo is an artistic movement that seeks to represent and emphasize the marginalized and exploited position of indigenous peoples throughout Latin American history. The movement was most influential in the Andean region, Central America, and in Mexico. The Peruvian writer Jose Carlos Mariategui established the scope of literary indigenismo and explained how indigenismo could not give a strictly accurate version of indigenous peoples because it was literature written by white or mestizos who viewed the culture from the outside. Arguedas took issue with this statement and spent his life attempting to recreate the voice and worldview of those whose language and culture he lovingly and painfully shared. From the early Agua stories, but especially from Jaguar Fiesta onwards, Arguedas would distance himself from simplistic versions of indigenismo in which writers had positioned themselves as both exterior and superior to the culture they were writing about. Here was a person who spoke Quechua since childhood, one who had been a school teacher in an indigenous village and had become an expert on Andean music and song. Arguedas, as a bilingual and bicultural writer, allowed Andean oral culture to inform and shape his writing. 
Notable in Argueda's work is his language, where Quechua and Spanish words surge together, derive straight from an experience where they coexist and complement each other. His critically acclaimed novel, Los Rios Profundos, Deep Rivers, is an autobiographical novel of self-growth. Ernesto, an adolescent white Peruvian boy, raised among Quechua speakers, attends a provincial religious boarding school populated by students of varied social and ethnic backgrounds. In one part of the novel, Ernesto visits Cusco for the first time and is deeply moved by the experience of seeing a building with two architectural styles, Inca and Spanish. There are three interrelated dimensions of coloniality that Arguedas is challenging in this scene. The coloniality of knowledge, time, and language. I marked in blue the more narrative uh, aspects of this fragment, and in green, the more descriptive one. And um, as I said, I ran to see the wall, it turned a corner, ran the length of a wide street and continue along the narrower, dark one that climbed the hill and reek re of or urine. While I read my thoughts on this, um, on this fragment, um, it's good that you have the, the translation and the, the underlines of, of things. Um, so what is challenging here, for example, is the subject-object interaction. In this scene, the subject-object interaction is clear by the infiltration of narrative phrases into descriptive speech. The pure description slides into a field in which the observer, Ernesto, takes on as much importance as the observed object. We are in fact facing a sort of ritual. First, the character looks at the wall from a distance, then he approaches the stones, and the alternation of away and nearby is repeated ceremonially. For Ernesto, the intensity of the call of the Inca wall exceeds the mere act of contemplation. So sight is followed by touch. First he looks at the wall, then he touches it. It is as if the object imposes a kind of proximity and as if the subject drawn by the force that emanates from the stones accepts the rules imposed by the object. In other words, the ego and the object are joined and become one same continuity, while in Western rationalism, exactly the opposite occurs. And the analytical and temporal qualities of the objects of knowledge separate the knower from what is known. In terms of challenging the European concept of time and the coloniality of time. European colonization meant that the indigenous cultures around the world began to be conceived as living in the past. They began to be conceived as prehistoric. As Johannes Fabian powerfully demonstrated, geopolitics has its ideological foundation in the politics of time or chronopolitics. In Fabian's words, this means a denial of covalness. Coeval means having the same age or date of origin, contemporary. The denial of covalness that Fabian identified in the philosophical foundation of anthropology in the 19th century was fully at work since the 16th century in the Spanish Empire. Indigenous people were denied the right to live in the present. Instead, they were conceived as living in the past. This, of course, persisted during the modernization period of post-independence and nation building. Later in the chapter, uh, the, the, the character starts reflecting both in Spanish and in Quechua. So by using both Spanish and Quechua in a dialogic interaction, Arguedas is embracing what in decolonial theory is called the denial of the denial of covalence. Quechua is then presented as a contemporary language interacting with the Spanish in the formation of thoughts. In this respect, we should recall that Arguedas was once famously described himself as a modern Quechua individual. So in terms of language and challenging the coloniality of language, 
It is important to bear in mind that by the time Arguedas published the first episode of Los Rios Profundos in 1948, Quechua was the most widely pre-Hispanic language spoken in Peru and had been marginalized since the, um, since the insurrection of Tupac Amaru in 1780. Typically, in indigenista novels, the Quechua words um, are um, in uh, the Quechua words are used in the in by the characters, never by the narrators, and it's a, a, a characterizing element that the uh, writers in in, in indigenista novel would put if they if any word at all in Quechua, it would be just the character, not the, of course, in this case, the narrator, the, the, the character is also the narrator, but it's important that uh, in, in Ernesto's mind, both languages start to interact uh, in, uh, in equal terms. And um, so I have four minutes, Suleika? Four minutes, okay. So um, after, After, the important thing is that I want to highlight this after um, publishing this uh, novel, uh, Arguedas decided to start publishing his own uh, poetry in Quechua. Uh, and again, his, his, his poetry is not a poetry that he doesn't uh, engage in uh, melancholic reconstruction and evocation of the Inca past. He speaks about contemporary uh, topics in his um, Quechua poetry. So to end up, um, I, I would like to share with you some thoughts about where can we more vividly see uh, the legacy of um, Arguedas and Borges. Um, Walter Mignolo has studied Sargeda poetry as a way of redressing the asymmetry of languages. He also referred to Borges as a paradigmatic case of epistemic and uh, aesthetic decolonization. To uphold and develop Borges and Arguedas legacy, one has to engage in a constant and daily praxis that helps to expand and secure our decolonial consciousness. This is seen in contemporary writers such as Mayra Santos Febres and Judith Ortiz Koffer. Mayra Santos Febres is a professor of literature at the University of Puerto Rico. You can see there her uh, work. And um, she coined um, a concept of translocality. And uh, translocality defines literary expressions that are written in condition of circular migration. It focuses on the literary practices between English and Spanish, the geographical reference, references to both Puerto Rico and New York, as well as the narrative construction of self through literature and how this movement, circular migration, is inscribed in the written page. So I'm going to finish uh, with a poem by Judith Ortiz Koffer, which, in which we can um, have a sense of the translocality. In her bilingual poem, Lesson One, I Would Sing, Ortiz Koffer highlights a characteristic of Spanish language which she defines as a resource for hope and creativity. She writes, in Spanish, cantaría means I would sing. Cantaría bajo la luna, I would sing under the moon. Cantaría cerca de tu tumba, by your grave, I would sing. Cantaría de una vida perdida, of a wasted life, I would sing. If I may, if I could, I would sing. In Spanish, the conditional tense is the tense of dreamers, of philosophers, fools, drunkards, of widows, new mothers, small children, of old people, cripples, saints, and poets. It is the grammar of the expectation and the formula of hope. Cantaría, amaría, viviría. Please repeat after me. <laughs> the works of Ortiz Koffer and Santos Febres, among others, are representative of the powerful and diverse body of intellectual responses to the challenges presented by the cultural dimension of coloniality and the need of intellectual decolonization. Identifying contemporary expressions of this type of works is fundamental to my research in literary decoloniality since they honor and develop the decolonizing legacies of writers like Jorge Luis Borges and Jose Maria Arguedas. Thank you very much. All right, well, for, for me, given that The Lost Steps is generally read as a critical novel, mm -hmm. 
I think it's important to essentially mark the limits of that critique. Um, and of course, I understand that Carpentier was writing in 1953, and it was a specific milieu. And I do think, I mean, I love his literature. I think that novel, The, the Lost Steps, is amazing. It's not um, a judgment call on the quality of the work. What I do think is that there have been developments in thought, and especially in Latin American thought, through yeah, decolonialists through Aníbal Quijano, Walter Mignolo, Enrique Dussel, that challenge a lot of the naturalized ideologies that we hold and about the way that we speak about Latin America and where we think from. And so my intention with that paper was to actually basically evaluate Capertin's critique within that other framework. So basically look at the limits of his critique. And well, of course, Latin America, I mean, the, the, the intellectual tradition of Latin America is this as he said, this mixture between Europe and something that is say, autochthonous or, I don't think there's a solution. I don't think there's a single, oh, the answer is, by the way, everyone, the answer is this. But I do think it's important to actually critically analyze and think through these concepts and these things because they are, I mean, at the moment, I think the last 20 years, there's, there's, for what, 15 years maybe, there's been you know, this really interesting revolutionizing new field that is emerging that is kind of groundbreaking and that requires to be engaged. So I don't know if I've answered your question. I just yeah. think we need to incorporate new what material. What do you call it? Like 15 years. Uh, so it's what, what, well. Neality? Is that what you're talking Well, it's, it's the modernity, it's modernity coloniality. So it's a critique, I think you mentioned, of, of coloniality and the colonial matrix of power. Um, I mean, it's a huge thing that it would be kind of impossible, I think, for us to summarize here. But it's about, what? Well, it's about the fact that there are the colonial matrix of power that was instituted with the arrival of Europeans in, in Latin America and that then led to modernity as well is still in play today, essentially. It's still, those structures are still in, in play today in, and they, they're noticeable or visible throughout basically all of the spheres of our life from epistemology to language from you know, literature to sexuality, from politics to development, whatever. Um, and so I think it's, it's radical and it's new and I think it deserves to be engaged. So. Yeah, um, well, basically what, what I'm interested in, in, in it's, it's, it's a break away with Eurocentrism. Uh, uh, one thing is the uh, Europe itself and the, the legacy of Europe. Another thing is to have, I mean, a, 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 a Eurocentric view uh, of the world, what 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 in in the paradigm modernity slash coloniality we 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 say slash coloniality because uh, for us modernity is the historical process through which Europe self appointed itself as the center of the world, and um, by one thing is the political colonialism or economic colonialism. Uh, but in, in, more specifically, our, our republics declared the independence politically and juridically from Spain in the 19th century. But uh, so we could say that the political and, judici and judicial system uh, has break away with, coloni with the colonialism, political colonialism. But um, the, uh, as I said, the, the mental structure, the intellectual um, and, uh, power structures of, col of colonialism, their legacies are come by this uh, concept of coloniality. You know? and, and, and there are, uh, when we say coloniality of knowledge, of coloniality of language, of coloniality uh, of power, it means w which area we are emphasizing. But coloniality accounts for the legacies and the persistence of the, the, the colonial system. And, and those uh, legacies are, are um, um, Eurocentrism is one of those, um, one of the most important uh, and enduring legacies that uh, we all feel is, 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 is uh, it urged us to, to break away with. Because uh, Eurocent when I mean Eurocentrism as, as a perspective of knowledge, that the knowledge generated in, in, in Europe uh, it's, it's, it's more important than the knowledge generating where somewhere else. In, in Latin America and up until uh, well, you know, uh, well, almost at, uh, by the 1970s and 80s, if, if you wanted to study any Latin American writer, 
the first thing was well, okay, let's study from, from Foucault, from from George Steiner, from, from an European perspective. So now we are building our own theory too. It's not that we want to deny uh, the, 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 the input of, of Europe, but uh, if we, f rather than starting from the European perspective, well, we have a couple of people here who have been saying, this is how it works. Jose Martí, Juan Poma Ayala, uh, Jose Carlos Mariategui. Uh, and uh, why, why do I have to know Michel Foucault uh, first, and then uh, 20 years later, to know who Jose Carlos Mariategui was? Well, I do. I want to say something to that. Um, I think it's nothing like Eduardo Valiano, and although I like his work, but I want to add something to what you were talking about modernity, coloniality, and he said modernity slash coloniality. And that's basically that generally we think of modernity as something that occurred in its own right, as, you know, say, the, from the Enlightenment or. And one of the things that is argued by writers like Ijano and Dusa and Mignolo is that that dash, that modernity dash coloniality, means that you would not have had modernity unless you had that colonial expansion and that, you know, the taking of lands, the resources, the enslaving people, the having that superiority of Europe as a superior, you know, universal subject with that a place in a, and then all of the other subjects, all of the other cultures as being peripheral and, and secondary to that. So the modernity coloniality, is, it's more complex because it actually, I mean, we don't read much contemporary analysis that looks at modernity and, and coloniality together. So you have this idea that modernity is something else, is the you know, um, development of Europe for, I don't know, because they're smarter or nicer or richer or, you know. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're running a bit of time, uh, but I just would like actually to finish that from a, from a perspective that of someone who studies that from politics angle and not, you know, I think we've been having heavy, heavy discussions about exactly the kinds of questions you've, you've posed. And actually, I think it's very helpful for one thing we've been trying, you know, to, to discuss is that it's not about saying one is more important than the other, but especially as academics in Western academia, we've been facing a resistance, a tremendous resistance to try to bring another language. And, and this language is sometimes by even the references we made. We, ne we need first to show that we master all, you know, the big names of what's considered to be high culture or high literature. If we write a paper based on Latin American intellectuals, we don't publish. So it's very interesting. I think the process is not superiority of knowledge, but the project is a project. It's full of problems, and I think you have actually nailed every single problem of that. And even myself, like who am I? You know, I've got a Japanese, and it's not even Japanese, Japanese, and born in Brazil now talking about Latin America. I mean, what's the legitimacy I may have to talk about that? But I think it's the experience, uh, and that's what we've been talking, if it's part of the experience of being an outsider, that, pull, uh, that made us face the other as well, and made us face the resistance. And through that process, we actually tried to find an answer. And I think a lot of the, like, um, Dussel and Gnolo are not in their original countries. And perhaps it's part of a phenomenon of this, what, you know, we'd say the spaces in between, that we've been displaced in a way from our comfort zone, thinking that we could fully integrate, but actually we are not allowed to fully integrate unless you dominate a particular scheme of thought. And I think the, the political thing here is about pluridiversity, you know, the, the, the ability to think equally valuable through different frames. And I mean, not sure I've <laughs> resumed the project, but for me, the political aspect of the project that is interesting is that, is to say that if we, if we are part of La Malinche, twice by mixes of all kinds of races, that's equally recognizable and valuable. That doesn't require us to go first and learn three Latin languages plus English perfectly to be able to speak and be heard. I think that that's part of the, the politics of this and, and the renaissance of this literature through a lot of people who are actually writing from the United States and from other countries. Uh, Latin American born, but were in other parts of the world. So I'm sure the ambassadors will be able to help us a lot through your experience of being around the world all the time. But thank you very much, <laughs> you. and please enjoy thank the drinks.